before we start with, you know, with any dietary changes, um, it's really about making you the most resilient that you can be. Welcome to the doctor's pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman and that's pharmacy with an F, a place for conversations that matter. And if you care about your brain, which I do, and then this conversation is going to matter to you because we have an incredibly brilliant guy, a true genius in my mind, Max Lugavier, who's been a longtime friend, uh, an inspiration, even though he's half my age, <laughs> because he digs into the science of what it takes to have a genius life, which sounds like a great aspiration. He's a filmmaker. He's a health science journalist. He's the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Genius Foods, Become Smarter, Happier, and More Productive While Protecting Your Brain for Life, which sounds so awesome. It's published in eight languages. And he's also the host of the number one iTunes health podcast, The Genius Life, which I've been on. So I'm so excited. So Max also appears on the Dr. Oz show and he gets way more traction on there than I. I don't know why, because <laughs> I'm like an advisor and I'm, <laughs> I, I guess I'm old, old story. Rachel Ray, the doctors, he's contributed to Medscape, Vice, Fast Company, CNN, The Daily Beast, and NBC Nightly News, The Today Show, Wall Street Journal. He just is the guy. I love him. He's a brilliant man, and he's got a great heart, and he cares about this topic. And his new book, The Genius Life, Heal Your Mind, Strengthen Your Body, and Become Extraordinary, is a lifestyle guide to living happily and healthily with proven research-based lifestyle tactics. I like tactics. <laughs> tactics are good. So Tips, welcome, tricks. Max. Thanks for having me. What an honor. What a pleasure. Now, like most of us in this space uh, who have to, had to dig into the science, um, it o always wasn't for a great reason. Like I became an expert in functional medicine because I became super ill and I had to figure out what to do about it. And you had a similar experience um, with your mother. And, and, and we've been in touch a lot about your mother over the years. And, uh, and she died last year and you dedicated your book to her. And, uh, and for people who really don't know you or know your story, I'd love to share uh, with our audience what what would happen with your mom and, and how did that inspire what you're doing? Yeah, my mom is the, the chief inspiration for, uh, for everything that I do. When she was 58. I was in my late 20s when she started to display these mysterious symptoms. You know, she had a, a, there was a change to her cognitive abilities. It had seemed almost as if overnight she had had a brain transplant with somebody 40 years her senior. Wow. <laughs> um, and yeah, no, it's, it, it was crazy. And she also, there was a change to her gait, which is the way that, you know, a person walks. And it was at the Cleveland Clinic, actually, in Ohio, long before I think you had gotten there. Yeah. But where for the first time she was diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disorder. And the, the diagnosis was actually pretty murky. It was unclear as to what she had. But nonetheless, she was prescribed drugs for both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And just to give some context, I had no prior family history of any type of neurodegenerative disease. As I mentioned, my mom was not old. She was young. She was young. She was 58. She was spirited, youthful. Young to me. I'm 60. That's like, you know, teenager practically. <laughs> I mean, yeah, she has somebody, somebody in the prime of her life. Mm. Um, and when we got that diagnosis, it sent my world into a tailspin. I, it was the first time in my life I'd ever had a panic attack. I just re I remember sitting in the Holiday Inn in Cleveland, Ohio, after receiving those prescriptions from the from the from the um, well-respected neurologist who we saw just a few hours prior, and Googling for the first time the drug names and looking at the Wikipedia's for Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's mm. disease. Which, you know, I mean say whatever you want, those are the places that I think most people go when they, you know, they consult Dr. Dr. Google. Google. Yeah, <laughs> of course. And so I was no different. I, that's what I did. I, I, I went there. I didn't have a background in medicine, of course. And um, seeing how little these drugs, these pharmaceutical biochemical band-aids, how little they mm -hmm. do for conditions as complex as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, um, I just, I started to uh, I mean, freak out, you know, what, yeah. what was going to happen to my mom? Was mm. I going to lose her? Was she going to forget who I was? And that really, that was the line in the sand where from then on I became just fixated on trying to find a better way, looking for solutions in the medical literature that could both maybe act, you know, therapeutically for my mom. Um, but in tandem with that, I was also trying to understand why this would have happened to her and what could be done to prevent it from happening to myself. And one of the most shocking findings that I stumbled upon, which, you know, you know, you know, well, 
is that often dementia begins in the brain decades before the first symptom. Yeah. And so it became very clear to me that this is something that if we really want to move the needle in this category of diseases, we really have to start today talking about prevention. It's so true. I think most people don't realize that you know, if you have Alzheimer's, the first changes in your brain can happen 30, 40 years before you forget your keys. And it's actually something you can look at on a brain scan. And I think it, you know, it inspired you to ask a whole bunch of questions that you know someone really without a medical degree usually doesn't ask, which is, you know, what causes these symptoms? And your mother had something called Lewy body dementia, which is sort of a cross between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and affects motor function, and affects memory and cognitive function. And you sort of had to look in the literature and go like, well, what causes this? And how do I? not get it myself and so it was both from the love of your mother and self-interest that you sort of became an expert on how to fix your brain yeah yeah it's become a major passion of mine to say the least i mean i think the brain is the most important organ it, it really is who we are as neuroscientist df swab famously says and it's actually he has a book by this by the same title we are our brains mm -hmm. and to watch somebody who you love more than anything in the world descend into decrepitude <clears throat> mm -hmm. is the hardest thing imaginable. Yeah. I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy. Mm. And that being said, you know, there are ample things that we can now that we can do in the literature to protect our brains as they age. And yeah. we don't know everything. 90% of what we know about Alzheimer's disease has been discovered only in the past 15 years. Yeah. But we don't have to sit idly on our hands. And I think that's the point. Yeah. I think, you know, you've been part of our broken brain series and, you know, we delve deeply into understanding the various aspects of why brains break <laughs> and how to fix them. And, uh, you know, as a functional medicine doctor, I've seen so many patients with these conditions actually get better. Uh, and, and once you start to understand the biology and how, how the brain works, what injures the brain, what are the things that are we call dementogens? <laughs> wow, <laughs> that, dementogens, wow. Yeah, and how do you do like a cognoscopy mm. <laughs> as opposed to a colonoscopy, which is how do you really look at all the things that can impact brain function it opens up a whole world of possibility of how to help these people. And you know, your latest book, uh, Genius Life, uh, the Genius Life, you expand on the Genius Food Plan, and, and and the whole approach in there that was mostly focused on nutrition and how it affects brain health. And and we know that um, our brain health and our cognitive function, our emotional wellness, really depends on so many things like our gut and our hormones and our heart and our nervous system. And there's constantly crosstalk and communication the body's a web that's really what we focus on in functional medicine the body is a a network and it's all connected and just because you know your stomach isn't in your brain doesn't mean it's not related to your brain and your immune system and everything else so um tell us about the research around um things that you found that help us to understand how to prevent dementia and how to optimize your brain function yeah, so I mean, to, to start off, when I think, I think as a functional medicine practitioner, what, I, what I've been able to glean from my exposure to the field through you know, colleagues like you and David Perlmutter and guys like that, you know, you're really having to undo the, the, the education in a way that you've had um, in allopathic medicine that really kind of takes a reductionist approach, yeah. you know, looking at the brain as separate from the body. And in fact, I can corroborate that when I had these experiences with my mother in the clinician's office, at the most storied cathedrals to Western medicine. Yeah, you know, Cleveland Clinic. Like Cleveland <laughs> Clinic, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Columbia in New York, NYU. I've gone to all these places with yeah. my mom. It's the same thing. It's, you know, the, the not, no second opinion. There's the same opinion over and over. Over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that, that that can be very upsetting and it can, um, you know, it, it, in, in, it elicits a sense of hopelessness. Um, and that's what I experienced, that same reductionist sort of approach. I think what's given me the edge, um, again, you know, not as a, as a trained medical doctor or anything like that, but I think there's a, a certain level of creativity is required to connect dots and to see mm -hmm. patterns where others mm -hmm. might not. And as a functional medicine practitioner, my sense is that that's kind of how you're trained. Totally. You're, tra you're trained to think about these topics in a more creative way. Um, and that's something that I just intuitively did when I started to experience what was going on with my mom. And I just intuitively realized that, you know, the brain is influenced by the body. How could it not be? Duh. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so Genius Foods really was a nutritional care manual to the human brain. Um, you know, unfortunately, the brain doesn't come with an owner's manual. It was a, a book that really... Neither does the body. Neither does the body. <laughs> 
But that's what the genius life to me. That's kind of where I was going with the text as mm. I was writing the genius life the to make it manual for yeah, your brain for the for the yeah and the body and the, and to really um, uh, unveil the connection that the brain has to the body. I think a lot of people don't realize that they're connected. You know, you can't yeah. look in the mirror and flex your hippocampus the way you can your bicep. So, I think it's important for people to be able to, um, you know regain a sense of of bodily health mm -hmm. because of all of the benefits that that's going to provide to the to the brain better mood better mental health better cognitive function um so this is a it's sort of like a, a care manual to the body and it goes beyond nutrition so yeah. nutrition is just one part of the story as you know you talk about that in yeah. um, food fix but exercise our the, the relationship that we have with nature the relationship that we have with temperature the relationship that we have with light the ever-present um, environmental toxins that your average human is exposed to on a daily basis. Uh, these are all the kinds of topics that I wanted to talk about in the book. Wow, so, so people talk about lifestyles, you know, what you eat, sleep, exercise, stress. You don't hear people talking about light and nature and temperature, right? Right, right, right. Fascinating. They're, yeah, they're all super important parts of the puzzle. Um, I mean, the relationship that we have light with light. They're all inputs that regulate our biology yeah. in ways that we are now understanding that we didn't understand before. Well, consider this. So I started, I was thinking a lot about cancer because my mom actually, Labor Day of 2018, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and uh, another horrific... She didn't die from the brain disorder. She, she died didn't. from pancreatic cancer. Yeah. yeah. She, I had just gotten back to LA from a trip and I got a call from my brother who was in New York with my mom and she had turned yellow. Mm. So usually if you turn yellow, it's either you've eaten too many carrots or you've become jaundiced for whatever reason. And yeah. the difference is that the whites of your eyes become yellow yeah. when you're jaundiced. And oftentimes you'll see a gallstone, but they did an MRI of my mom's abdomen and what they found was a tumor on the head of the pancreas. Yeah. And as you know, 90 plus percent of the time when they diagnose pancreatic cancer, it's already too late. You know, too late. Um, and it was brutal and barbaric and it was the worst thing I, I ever experienced, but that my mom developed not one, but two of humanity's most feared conditions really, you know, made me start to think about the world in a, in a new way. And going back to light, you know, I mean, there are certain instances where light it's been proposed and this is a, 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 a you know, a rapidly evolving science. We're just at the tip of the iceberg, but can actually act as a carcinogen light. Yeah. What kind of light? Well, artificial bright light at night that suppresses the hormone melatonin. Ah. Melatonin is a key gatekeeper to the process known as autophagy, which is when our cells clean house. And through, you know, it's sort of like the Con the KonMari method for biology that it uses to clean up old, worn out, uh, dysfunctional proteins and organelles. It's also involved in DNA repair. Yeah. So DNA damage is at the root of of um, cancer, so aging. How we get our, our rate of waste and how we repair our systems is yeah. regulated by melatonin and light. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's kind of a bold statement and it, it's a hypothesis that certainly <laughs> warrants uh, further testing to know for sure. But there is a, a well-documented increased risk of certain cancers seen in night shift workers, which make up 20% of the, of the global workforce. Yeah. So getting bright light in through your eyes in the morning is crucially important for anchoring your body's circadian rhythm which guides everything from how uh, coordinated we feel, how much focus we're able to have, how much energy we're able to have, how well we digest and metabolize food. But in the latter half of the evening, avoiding exposure to extremely bright light, um, especially if it's on an ongoing chronic basis, I think is... is especially we're equal. all being wearing those goofy glasses with the, with the like Dave Asprey with the, the, the uh, orange <laughs> lenses. Amber glasses, yeah, like amber colored blue, blue light blocking glasses. I think that among all the wellness biohacking gimmicks that are out there, I think that those are among the most useful, yeah. Yeah, and it's powerful because I remember uh, reading a number of years ago about studies in, in animals where they would give them melatonin and it would suppress cancer. Yeah, and part of that has to do with the light, which um, actually inhibits melatonin. So if you're, you know, living as a hunter gatherer, the sun goes down. You maybe got a few candles. Maybe they didn't have candles back then. Maybe they didn't have fire when we <laughs> start out. Yeah, and our bodies are designed that way. And now we have this incredible light. That's such an issue. I remember reading a book a number of years ago called Lights Out. You ever come across that book by T. S. Wiley? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And the, it was a, it was like an eye opening book, uh, literally, uh, and it was about the, how the invention of the light bulb correlated with all these chronic diseases we're seeing now. Huh? Yeah, I don't. I mean, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and it talked about the 
the biology of light mm -hmm. and how it impacted us. And uh, we don't even think about it. And we just are on our phones all night uh, or have computers in our beds. We have bright lights and, and there are ways to fix it. So what are the ways people can fix the light problem? Yeah. Well, I think there's two things. First of all, you want to make sure that you're getting good quality light early in the day. So preferably before noon. So not only is that going to help anchor your body's circadian rhythm, but it's going to help protect you against blue light induced uh, melatonin suppression later in the day. So that bright light, you know, the suppression so go outside, don't wear sunglasses, go outside, don't wear sunglasses or don't wear sunglasses when you're driving to work. If you have a half an hour commute to work Does and it get through your windshield. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all about the light intensity. What you need is about a thousand lux of light. And there's an app that I have no, no affiliation with, but it's called Lux. And you can, there's some questions as to how reliable it is, but I think it can give you a good relative sense to the, the light intensity in your ambient mm, environment. Mm. So if you download the app, you can kind of just, you know, make sure that you're spending time in an environment that's at least 1000 lux in the morning, because that seems to be the light intensity that the melanopsin proteins in our eyes are sensitive to that basically kicks off this 24 hour timer. Yeah. Um, so that I think that I think is crucially important. And, and so in other words, to actually have good sleep, you need to get outside and get sunlight in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. 100% good sleep begins actually the morning of mm -hmm. and 1000 lux of light. You know, those, these melanopsin proteins in your eyes that are sensitive, they act like a, like a light switch. They're not super sensitive because as you mentioned, then a hunter gatherer exposed to campfire or the stars in the sky would have their circadian rhythms all messed up. Right. Um, so it's not that sensitive. It requires again, a thousand lux and you can easily achieve that by standing by a window for about a half an hour. And even on an overcast day, you're going to get at least a thousand lux. Now the problem is maintaining that circadian rhythm has become one of the central challenges of modern life because that light intensity, which 150, 200 years ago, nothing would be a thousand lux. No, mm -hmm. there would be no artificial, you know, light, light. source that would reach a right. thousand lux. Right? right. But today we have TV screens, we have smartphone devices. You can easily walk into a drugstore or a supermarket and the lighting inside those bright <laughs> fluorescent lights are easily a thousand lux. Yeah, that's true. So it sends your circadian rhythm deep into the abyss. And that's one of the reasons why I think, and why it's been proposed that, you know, there's, we see ill health, you know, associated with people. It's who, true. You know, uh, one of, one of the founding kind of father doctors of functional medicine, one of my mentors, Sidney Baker hmm. wrote a book called their circadian prescription, which was all about exactly this circadian medicine. Uh, and there's even things like chronobiology where there are, there are different chemotherapy drugs that work better at different times, different organs are active at, at different times and they work better. And I think, uh, he even described in the book how in sports, if you look at the, the, the statistics, that teams that have to cross time zones typically lose more than the ones who don't and who are playing at home. Interesting. Yeah, so it's, it's a huge factor. Hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Before we continue, we have a quick message from Dr. Mark Hyman about his new company, Pharmacy, and their first product, the 10-Day Reset. Hey, it's Dr. Hyman. Do you have FLC? What's FLC? It's when you feel like crap. It's a problem that so many people suffer from and often have no idea that it's not normal or that you can fix it. I mean, you know the feeling. It's when you're super sluggish, your digestion's off, you can't think clearly, or you have brain fog, or you just feel run down. Can you relate? I know most people can. But the real question is what the heck do we do about it? Well, I hate to break the news, but there's no magic bullet. FLC isn't caused by one single thing, so there's not one single solution. However, there is a systems-based approach, a way to tackle the multiple root factors that contribute to FLC. And I call that system the 10-Day Reset. The 10-Day Reset combines food, key lifestyle habits, and targeted supplements to address FLC straight on. It's a protocol that I've used with thousands of my community members to help them get their health back on track. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a quick fix. It's a system that works. If you want to learn more and get your health back on track, Click on the button below or visit getpharmacy.com. That's get pharmacy with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y.com. Now back to this week's episode. So besides light, what else have you found that was sort of unusual in your, in your targeting optimization of the brain and the body or the brain body or the 
body yeah. mind or the mind body or no, it's everything not, yeah it's the same thing there is no separation is it, the point no separation mm. um i talk about the relationship that we have with temperature and how important that is um so cryotherapy cryotherapy saunas, yeah saunas cold. yeah and i'm i'm a, i always try to make things like my recommendations achievable by average people so you might not have access to a sauna you might not have, have not have access to a cryotherapy chamber but just getting into colder water, taking a cold shower, or exposing your wearing your skivvies like on your terrace um, during the cooler months can all be a great way of activating these ancient thermoregulatory mechanisms that we all have in us that we've allowed to gather dust mm -hmm. because we all live in a state of chronic climate control. And I think that by staying in that in that climate comfort zone all the time, it undermines some really powerful, um, you know, reparative and restorative. Uh, pathways that we have in our body. So what's the science of that? Well, I mean, cold being exposed to cold air boosts the proliferation of brown fat. So, I mean, we, we're all afraid of gaining more, even more fat on our waistlines and on our hips, but brown fat is actually something that we want to have more of. It's metabolically active. It's brown because it actually has a lot more mitochondria than normal white adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. And it, which are the energy factories in your cells, energy like factories energy, in your cells. Right? Yeah. They give you more energy, but they also, this brown fat actually burns fat and it burns sugar. And we can actually increase the amount of brown fat that we have on us. It's not actually visible. You can't see brown fat. It, it only accumulates in a few parts of the body in our armpits, around our collarbone, down our spines, um, shoulder blades. That's where you're going to see the brown fat. Um, you, you can't actually see it cause it's really relative to the amount of white fat that we carry. It's like a very <clears> small, small in concentration, but it's really good for our metabolic health. Mm. So whether that means turning down the thermostat. So you get more brown fat if you expose yourself to cold. Yeah. Mm. Because brown fat, it's there to, it, it burns calories to generate heat. So when you're in a cooler environment, this brown fat is burning calories to generate heat. Brown fat was actually um, originally identified in babies. Babies, when they get cold, they can't shiver. Babies can't shiver. So they have this brown fat that basically acts like an internal heating pad. Yeah. And for that reason, it wasn't known whether or not we carried this type of fat with us through adulthood. Mm. But now not only do we, in fact, carry this brown fat with us, which acts like an internal heating pad that burns calories, as I mentioned, but we can encourage its proliferation. Yeah. Well, the, the Tibetan monks knew this for years. They, they have a practice called Tumo. You know about this? No. Oh, Tumo is amazing. It's, is a, is a technique of, uh, called drying of the sheets. And so they train the monks to activate their brown fat through meditation. And they have them up in like the Himalayas and the monasteries way up in the freezing mountains. Wow. And they practice by dipping cold sheets in ice water and they wrap the monks in the sheets and the monks have to dry the sheets with their internal body heat. And when they can do that, they send them up overnight into the snow with a basically a loincloth. Oh, man. And they have to stay alive. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and they do. And it's quite an amazing practice. And, uh, you know, we've had such a surge of things like saunas and cryotherapy. And, and you know, they're, they're, we haven't talked about it on the show, but there's something called zombie cells. Zombie cells. Like are, senescent cells. Yeah, the things that tend to kill us where are these sort of senescent or aging cells. And they just create a lot of nasty immune effects and inflammation in the body. And it's hard to get rid of them. But cryotherapy or Cold exposure is one of the key mechanisms for getting rid of these zombie cells to help extend longevity. And personally, you know, I found that when I was really sick, and even now it's a standard part of my practice, I go into a hot sauna or a steam, get really hot, and then I turn the bath, big bathtub, only cold water, and I jump in. Wow. And uh, it's pretty invigorating. But you feel afterwards like your whole nervous system is awake and you're alive and you're energetic and it clears your head. It's pretty striking. Am yeah, right? it is striking. It's, and when it, I had chronic fatigue syndrome, it was one of the few things that gave me like a half an hour, an hour of feeling some respite. Wow. Yeah. I use uh, that, that therapy regularly for, I have low back issues. I think a lot of people do. Mm. I feel it's like a powerful analgesic. Like I, I, it's, I get instant pain relief. Yeah. What it does for my mental acuity and my mood is... I mean, there's, I don't think that there's a drug as no. powerful as what no. that does. And it's, there's a <laughs> jump uh, in a cold lake. It'll wake you up. It'll wake you up. Yeah. But I also want to mention, uh, before, I, before moving on from cold, that there've also been a number of studies where they've taken, 
uh, people with type 2 diabetes, which is very common. Many people have blood sugar issues. You know, yeah, Pretty much every other human in America. <laughs> yeah. And they found that when taking subjects with type 2 diabetes and exposing them to just mildly cool temperatures, I believe anywhere between, I think it was somewhere between 60 and 66 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not, which is not mm-hmm. super cold. By making no other changes to their diets or lifestyles, they were able to achieve a, uh, a 40% improvement in insulin sensitivity, which is... a uh, you know, an effect size that you would expect by putting these patients on an, on an, on a new exercise regimen. Yeah. Just exposing them to cooler temperatures. Wow. So you don't have to get out of your chair. You just have to freeze. (laughs) Just yeah, activate that brown fat. Yeah. Leave your thermal comfort zone. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone, your bio, your best biology. Well, that brings up the next subject, which is nature is medicine because we're so isolated from nature, both the light experience we have isn't based on natural light cycles the temperature experiences we have aren't based on being exposed to the environment like we always have been and it has really detrimental health effects so you talk about you know nature and and how that is really uh the disconnection from nature is really a source of problems for us major um today we spend 93 percent of our time indoors uh you know in big cities and there's a lot of this research now coming out of japan on forest bathing. There's actually a, 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 a Japanese word, I believe it's karoshi or karyoshi, or, or I, I could be butchering it, but essentially there's a very significant portion of the population that gets worked to death in Japan. And there, I mean, 90%, 93% of, of Japanese people live in cities. So they're far removed from nature. And so this nature bathing line of research has really become a major focus. Wow. Yeah. And it's now being studied, you know, increasingly around the world, the relationship that we have with nature, especially as our cities become more and more dense and more and more polluted. But in The Genius Life, I talk all about the how air pollution can affect cognitive function and put us at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, 20% of Alzheimer's cases might be owed actually to heavily polluted air. And today, 52% of Americans live in environments with heavily polluted air. Isn't there like that there's some like UV app on your phone where you, or you can tell the air quality the air quality air, index yeah. yeah you can i believe you can actually i think the weather app on on an iphone tells you yeah um the air quality but yeah, yeah. my niece lives in houston she says every day they get warnings not to go outside <laughs> i mean it's scary uh, and, and our indoor home air can be just as polluted if not more polluted it can be than outdoor air but in regard to outdoor air what i think is um really the most pressing of concerns where brain health is concerned is what's called fine particulate matter. So particle, airborne particles that are two and a half micrometers or smaller that are actually able to enter, we breathe it, we breathe these particles in, they enter circulation and they can pierce the blood brain barrier and enter the brains. And they're doing yeah. studies now in very polluted parts of the world, like in Mexico City, yeah. where they'll take children and they'll actually see like these fine these particles like magnetite which is made of iron wow. in the brains of children wow and what's very interesting mark you know uh like rudy tanzi up at harvard doing all this research on you know viruses in the brain and how the, it can the microbiome of the brain yeah. yeah the microbiome of the brain and how amyloid might be a response to an inflammatory insult in the brain the amyloid is like the gunk that clogs up your brain if you have alzheimer's and it, it, it's sort of a in response to inflammation it's sort of like a band-aid in a way yeah what they're seeing now is amyloid presence in brains that that you know of people who have inhabited very uh, highly air polluted you know areas with very high level concentrations wow. of air pollution. Yeah. So whether it's like magnetite, you know, or other fine particles, or the herpes virus, amyloid is like this protein which may be actually coming to the rescue. But the point is that being in a in a place where there's a high concentration of air pollution might actually be creating this inflammatory insult. Uh, to the brain, which is causing this this a very early presence of the pathologies that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. So, so connect that back to nature because you're saying we should move, all move out of cities and become farmers. More that connected be, to nature, yeah, <laughs> that would be good. Yeah, I mean, there are some things that you can do. So, spending spending more time in nature, um, I think, is super important, especially if you are at heightened genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if you're an APOE4 allele carrier, you know, making an effort to spend more time in, in nature. And that's a gene that increases your risk. If you have two of those genes, like of getting well, Alzheimer's by 14 yeah. percent yeah. Um, so, doing that, also getting out in nature is crucially important because of the exposure to the sun. So, exposure to the sun, I think, is very important. We were talking all about circadian biology 
exposure to bright light, crucially important. Vitamin D, vitamin D uh, deficiency is thought to be a risk factor for developing um, Alzheimer's disease. There's a, a review of environmental risk factors that I talk about in the <clears throat> book, and vitamin D was one of the top. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a big deal because, you know, depending on the data you look at, up to 80% of us are insufficient or deficient. And the way the reference range works is it's it's based on a population measure. So you take a group of people, you measure, you know, a spectrum of the, the levels in a population, and then you look at sort of what's the average, right? And you have like two standard deviations from that, and you can kind of determine what's, what's quote, normal. But normal isn't optimal. If you were right. a Martian and you landed in America today, 75% of Americans are overweight. It would be normal to be overweight. It does not mean it's optimal. So the levels we often see in the laboratory ranges are not really where we should be hitting. The levels can be 20 or 30, but you should really probably have 45, 50, 60 at least. And I think you know probably 80% of us are deficient or insufficient, and that leads to depression. It leads to increased for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, cancer, so many different things and i think you know there's been mixed data about we're placing it fixing it or not and i think it's complicated because when you're like you know people are eating you know garbage and they throw vitamin d in there it's not going to help them. yes correct <laughs> you know if they're not exercising they're smoking they're drinking a lot they're not ex they're, they're eating crap you take a vitamin d it's not going to do anything but if in in all things being equal people who are low in vitamin d have higher risk of this and if you clean up your lifestyle and you're still low in vitamin d it'll make a big difference. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up context because one thing that, that f very few people know, you could be spending as much time in the sun as you want, frolicking all day you know, in the, in, the, in the beautiful warming rays of the sun or even supplementing with vitamin D, but if you're not getting adequate magnesium in your diet, which 50% of the population does not get no, adequate true. magnesium, the enzymes that convert the vitamin D that your skin creates into its act active hormone form in the body all are magnesium dependent. Yeah. And magnesium, half of us don't consume adequate magnesium. It's found in dark leafy greens, pumpkin seeds, dark chocolate, almonds. Yeah. And, it's and, a and a lot of things cause us to lose magnesium. Stress, coffee, alcohol, yeah. sugar, caffeine, you know, all, all those things we love. Exactly. Magnesium is like an anti-aging, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's a macro mineral. We don't consume enough of it. And uh, it's involved in all of the DNA repair enzymes. We were talking a little bit about DNA damage. They all require magnesium as a cofactor. Um, it's involved in ATP synthesis, so energy production. It's so true. I see so much in my practice, and these patients come in with all these magnesium deficient symptoms, and they think I'm a genius when I give them magnesium, and they go away. Things like migraines or headaches, constipation, muscle cramps, twitching, palpitations, anxiety, insomnia, anything that's irritable, twitches or spasms in any way or cramps is usually magnesium deficiency. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy when people take it, they go, oh my God, I didn't know I was so low. And I think you're right, it's, a, it's so prevalent. And I think uh, as you age also, your skin doesn't really convert magnesium, I mean, vitamin D as well either, right? Yeah, if I, I make um, specific recommendations in the book for people no matter where they are in their life, no matter what age they are, um, it's important. You know, context is, is is everything, really. But you're right. People who are overweight, people who have darker uh, skin complexions, people who are older, they probably are going to need to spend more time in the sun to create the same amount of vitamin D. Um, yeah. So I once learned from Michael Hollick, who's a vitamin D expert. He said, if you really want to get adequate vitamin D without taking vitamin D, you have to basically be pr practically naked between 10 and 2 in the daytime for 20 minutes uh, south of Atlanta. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> and I, you know, that probably isn't happening for 99% of people. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Um, I try to get into the sun as much as I can. Because the other thing about the sun, we as humans, you know, we, I think that reductionist approach that we were talking about, it's, I think we're hardwired to try to break everything down. And I, I forget who, it, maybe it was Michael Pollan, but in, in nutrition, they call it nutritionism, yeah. where they like to break down foods into just the bare essentials to see if we can replicate it in a pill form, and that hasn't you know, really... Or, or identify, or we even do worse, we, we sort of identify the bad ingredients like saturated fat or sugar or whatever, and so we focus on regulating those in food, and then the food companies just kind of dial up or down different ingredients to sort of make it, quote, healthier, but it's not really, it's still junk food. Yeah, right? exactly. And so I think we can apply the same thing to the benefits of, of getting sun exposure uh, on our skin and in through our eyes. So, I mean, vitamin 
D is created when the UVB rays from the sun reach our skin. But UVA rays might actually be useful in terms of creating nitric oxide and actually helping us lower our blood pressure. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so blood pressure is another topic that I talk about in the book because it's so related to brain health. If you want your brain to be performing well, if you want it to age well, you really have to make sure that your blood pressure uh, is, is in a healthy range. And getting the right amount of sunlight can help? Can help. Yeah. Getting, wow. the, getting the right amount of sun. Now, now, you know, mental health is such a big crisis in this country. Um, you know, one in four people experience major depression in their life. Uh, it's the biggest cause of the economic burden of chronic disease, not from direct health care costs, but things like disability, loss of quality of life, not being able to function very well in your life. And, um, and you know, vitamin D is one of those things that seems to really impact depression. Uh, so you, you talk about a study in the book that has to do with vitamin D and depression. Can you talk more about that? Well, vitamin D is important for the synthesis of serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter involved in mood. Um, a lot it's of people, a happy chemical. It's a happy chemical. That's what, that's what Prozac does. It increases serotonin, right? Increases serotonin. Um, you know, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, can boost serotonin at the synapse, which is but serotonin is also involved in focus and attention and executive function. Um, but yeah, so vitamin D is important in the in the synthesis of serotonin from its raw material, raw, raw materials, um, one of which is tryptophan, an amino acid. So making sure that your vitamin D levels are in a normal, healthy range, uh, important. And you can easily get your vitamin D levels tested from a doctor. It's a very cheap test. Uh, the recommendations that I make in the book are to make sure that your levels are somewhere between 40 and 60 nanograms per milliliter, yeah. which seems to be a range where we see the lowest risk of all-cause mortality. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember reading a study that was incredible that women who had vitamin D levels less than 45 um, had a 60% higher chance of having preterm labor. Hmm. And when you think of the cost of you know neonatal intensive care and taking care of preterm babies, it's staggering. And you're talking about pennies for a vitamin that yeah. can liter <laughs> literally prevent preterm labor. So it's really connected to almost everything. And the the differences with vitamin D is that not everybody needs the same amount, right? So what should we be taking? Correct. Uh, not everybody needs the same amount. You really, before you start taking vitamin D as a supplement, uh, you ought to get your levels tested. Um, you know, when we make, when we synthesize it from the sun, our skin basically makes what we need and it breaks down the rest. It's really, it's, it's almost impossible to get too much vitamin D from the sun. Although lifeguards can have levels of 150. That's amazing. Right? Yeah. So, so, and that's not toxic. Right. I mean, it could increase, cal it increases calcium absorption. Um, so you, I always like to recommend vitamin K2 for people yeah. that are in, I mean, especially at those levels. Um, but with a vitamin D supplement, I think generally uh, there was a, a, a research calculation that suggested that for the general population, 2,000 international units a day mm -hmm. uh, would, be, would be ideal to get the average, you know, the average person to an optimal level. Um, but people, again, have different, uh, you know, people who are older might need to supplement more. Yeah. People who are overweight might need mm -hmm. to supplement more to get the same... Uh, improvement mm. and also you, you again yeah if people who are overweight tend to be low in vitamin d because it's a fat soluble vitamin so it all gets right. sucked into the fat and it doesn't get in their system that we need yeah it gets sequestered by fat tissue the same also can occur with other fat soluble vitamins like a uh e k yeah i don't know if you read this morning this morning probably not because you probably don't read the jam a pediatrics journal every day but <laughs> not pediatrics no <laughs> but i do and i i read this paper this morning that showed that if women when they were pregnant took 2800 units of vitamin d compared to 400 which is in the typical prenatal vitamin that there was a dramatic reduction in um the effects on uh, bad effects on bone when their kids were born in other words their their kids their babies had much higher bone density and then their risk later in life of osteoporosis was dramatically reduced. Hmm. So, and that, you know, that's almost 3,000 units, which most doctors don't even think about recommending. And, and some people, you know, may need up to five or 10,000 if they're not good absorbers, and there's genes that affect that. So people might need only 1,000, but I, I think 1,000 is minimum for most people. And, and it takes about 1,000 units to raise your blood level, 10 nanograms per deciliter. So if you're 20, you need at least 3,000 to get up to 50, right? 
and, and, and then you can see how you do. But I think people need to measure it. They need to check it and they need to make sure they're okay. And if not, take the right supplement and not the, the kind that you often get from your doctor, I hate to say, which is vitamin D2, which is not an active form of the vitamin, but vitamin D3. And you can get that over the counter now and you can get a thousand units and others, but you want to make sure you measure it, right? Yeah. I mean, vitamin D2 is the plant-based form of vitamin D mm-hmm. and vitamin D3 is the animal based form it's mm-hmm. bioidentical to what we create in mm-hmm. our own skin so you always want to make sure that you're taking vitamin d2 i mean sorry d3 okay so there yeah. that brings up a sticky question so it's, it's usually made from lanolin and other things that you can get it from sheep and stuff and they're fat um so what if you're vegan what do you do <laughs> is it that's a good question uh i've vegan sources of vitamin d3 um it, that's hard to get. Yeah, I, you're right. It's yeah, hard to it's get. just one more of those nutrients so, that you're just not really optimizing. Yeah, and, then, and often people don't convert vitamin D2 to D3. And if you're a vegan, you want to make sure you're you're checking vitamin D3. And you can also check D2. So you can see you might have a really high D2, but a very low D3. So it's important to make sure. Uh, I once uh, took care of this Hasidic rabbi, and um, he had a really bad thyroid problem. And I said, you really need to take this combination thyroid, but... Um, I don't know if it's okay. He's like, why? He said, well, it comes from you know pig. It's a whole thyroid extract from pig, and it's not kosher. <laughs> he says, it's fine. As long as it's for your health, and as long as you're not eating it, and it's a medicine, it's fine. Hmm. So I thought that was very interesting yeah. perspective. <laughs> I don't know. So, um, you know, the other thing you talk about in your book, uh, sort of connected to this whole circadian biology and how we can reset our clocks is... This idea of when we eat, because we often focus on what we're eating, how much we're eating, but we really don't focus that much on when we're eating. And there's a lot of interesting research lately on the when, uh, on fasting, intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating, all kinds of ideas that people are having that extend lifespan, that reduce the risk for many diseases. So tell us more about the importance of when. Yeah, well, it seems that uh, there's this eating paradigm that's emerging in the literature and it's being called early time-restricted feeding. So basically eating an earlier dinner seems to be associated with improvements in blood pressure and blood sugar independent of weight loss. So a lot of people online will say that intermittent fasting is really only useful insofar as it, it has an ability to help us control the amount of calories that we consume. But it seems to be the case that by not eating too late at night, you know, because as I mentioned, light is a major time setter that the brain uses to know what time of day it is and mm-hmm. optimize its processes accordingly. Mm. But food is another time setter. And it's a time setter for the periphery, for the clocks that are in our metabolic organs, you know, yeah. in, in the organs of digestion and what have you. And so eating too late at night might actually negatively affect things like blood pressure, blood sugar. So people like do intermittent fasting or what we call time restricted eating, they'll, uh, they'll eat at noon and they'll eat to eight at night is that a bad idea should be more like eight in the morning till four in the afternoon i mean that that might be ideal the thing the the issue is that we're not waking up with the sunrise and going to sleep with the sunset like our ancestors might have used to do yeah we i mean wake up a lot later we go to sleep a lot later so i think that to try to recreate um the optimal eating paradigm for our you know for for our, the the bodies that we've inherited might be a futile effort. So the, the recommendations that I make are to not eat for an hour or two after you wake up, mm. um, especially if you wake up with an alarm clock, because the problem is a lot of people who wake up artificially with an alarm clock to, you know, wake up, get ready for work, their melatonin levels actually haven't properly, it's, it's likely down. that their melatonin levels haven't come down. That's why they could be groggy when they wake up. Groggy, but also less insulin sensitive, you know? So if you're eating a if you're drinking a glass of orange juice or eating a bran muffin or whatever, first Which thing in the morning. you probably shouldn't do anyway for breakfast. Right. right. That's not a genius breakfast, right? Well, your listeners are savvy <laughs> and they're not eating like that, right? But um, I, hope, I hope you're not. <laughs> but um, but no, I mean, there there's a that is a mechanism by which, you know, your blood sugar can stay abnormally high. Mm. Um, whereas if you just perhaps are to wait an hour or, you know, and, and also a way that you can make sure that your melatonin levels have come down is, again, to get that bright light in through your eyes in the morning. So, so eat light for breakfast. Eat light for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, eat light. Eat eat light, especially if you have to wake up early. Um, and then to eat a, I mean, I would say that if you were going to eat a heavy meal, do it in the in the daytime, and then eat a lighter dinner. 
Um, of course, you'll be wanting to take a siesta in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. It's, so the Spanish had it right. That's right. Yeah. But I, you know, the thing is, I, I agree. I always said you shouldn't eat three hours before bed because your body's getting ready to repair and heal. Mm-hmm. And if it's digesting, it doesn't do such a good job. And if you want to gain weight, the best way to gain weight is night eating. <laughs> it's the best way. <laughs> yeah. And it's and it's and it's not because here's the thing. So like sometimes I. You know, I, I have these uh, confrontations with people in the fitness world who say, well, you know, a bagel isn't magically going to be 200 calories at 8.01 p.m., you know, if it's only 100 calories at 8 p.m. Um, and that's true. The calorie content of food doesn't change, right, no. from one time to the next. But it might actually, the disruption of your body's circadian rhythm might negatively affect hormones involved in energy metabolism, in hunger. So eating late at night could actually make you more hungry the following day. My favorite study I read when I wrote my book, Ultra Metabolism, like 15 years ago or more, was uh, they, they fed people, you know, the same calories in three meals over the day, or they fed them like one meal at night. And the ones who had the one meal at night with the same amount of calories gained weight. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, compared to the other group, even though they eat exactly the same amount of calories. Yeah. So. Because it might reduce uh, leptin, which is the metabolic uh, throttle, essentially, that dictates um, you know, our resting energy expenditure. Uh, it might actually increase levels of ghrelin, which is a hormone involved in hunger. Um, so these are all the indirect ways in which late night eating can actually make you gain weight. Whether okay. or not and, and leptin also um, actually causes a reduction in inflammation. It's anti- anti-inflammatory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the the system that you know that we've inherited is very complex, but there's a great uh, turn. There's a great way of, of of expressing it that I was able to glean from my interview with Sachin Panda, who's one of the leading experts on circadian biology. At a certain point in the evening, you have to kind of consider the kitchen having closed. You know, when you go into a restaurant <laughs> after hour. Happened me last night. I was in Washington D.C. and I. Went with my friend, Congressman Tim Ryan. We tried to go at a Miss Mexican place. It was like this healthy vegan kind of taco place. And they were shut. <laughs> like, the kitchen yeah, closed. Kitchen's closed. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't find some other place. Yeah. So, I mean, if you just think about your body mm-hmm. in the same way. And, you know, it's it's a little bit of a term of art. You're, you could digest anything at any time of day. Does that mean it's going to be optimal? Not necessarily. So, at a certain point, I would say give yourself an, give, give yourself an 8 p.m or 9 p.m. cutoff and say the kitchen's closed in your body and that's it, you know? Yeah. You're winding down, you're getting ready for bed, you're not going to be as insulin sensitive in the evening as you were during the day. Also, uh, metabolism, you know, especially when eating when eating lots of carbs can cause insulin to spike, which can ne- negatively affect hormones like growth hormone. Um, it can affect the way that your brain uh, cleans itself up because of an interaction with insulin degrading enzyme, which we know dismantles the, the plaques that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. So which is often called type three diabetes. Yes. Alzheimer's of the it's basically diabetes of the brain. If you're diabetic, your risk of Alzheimer's is four fold higher. That's four hundred percent higher. Yeah. That's staggering. It's a great We reminder. also talk about a couple other things that are really great for the brain, like exercise, which I think eighty plus percent of Americans don't get enough of. I uh, know. So what's the connection between brain health and exercise? Well, exercise is such a big topic and a lot of people are talking about it. I just think that it's really important to underscore that exercise is, you're always talking about how food is medicine. Exercise, exercise is, medicine. is medicine. Yeah, exercise. I always just say if exercise was in a pill, it would be the most powerful drug ever invented. It really would be. <laughs> it really would be. So I'm a big fan of resistance training. I think this is something that um, not enough people are talking about. Uh, women, I see, can be afraid of weight training. They don't want to get too big and too bulky. I've been trying to get jacked for 20 years it's not easy. It's not. It doesn't happen overnight. Resistance training, going to the gym, getting stronger, building muscle, prioritizing protein at every meal. It's gonna re, It's gonna cause your. It's gonna cause a recomp of your body essentially. Yeah. And um, I've been trying. I started at about sixty years old. I'm in the gym. Uh, it's struggle street, but I <laughs> struggle starting street. to like it. But I think it's working. I can see a big change in my body, and I feel stronger and less pain and. It's good. Yeah, I mean, at the if nothing else, having more muscle on your body provides a sink for ec- excess energy, for excess glucose, yeah, excess starch and sugar that's going to make its way onto your plate inevitably. 
you know, as much as we try to abide by the blood sugar solution, you know, and, and, <laughs> and others who have told us to, you know, to really... Wrote that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> great book. Uh, it's, it's important to, to note that like a New York City apartment, and I know you know this, Mark, there's not a lot of place to store stuff. Nope. And that's especially true in the body of sugar. Yeah. We have very limited, you know, there's very limited options in terms of where we can store the sugar that we consume. Muscle. Muscle is one of those places. Mm. And by growing more muscle, by getting to the gym, you provide a sink, basically, to soak up extra sugar that you might consume or starches or car, what, you know, what have you. That's good because, you know, yesterday I went to a class called Yoga Sculpt, which is basically like yoga with weights. Oh, wow. <laughs> which is hard as heck, but I, you know, I, I told myself it was good for me. And Max, <laughs> Max would be happy with me if I, if I did that. You're looking, you're looking lean. I mean, I got uh, it good, you know. Yeah. I know. I just, I, I didn't want to say this. I probably shouldn't say this, but, you know, if I eat healthy and exercise. And it's like I, I, I have to make sure I don't lose too much weight. Wow. Well, you know, so, um, yeah, there's also something that happens with exercise is really cool, which is that it stimulates this chemical in your brain. It's like miracle grow. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So exercise stimulates a protein called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. Or miracle grow for Miracle sure. grow for the brain, yeah. <laughs> um, it's It promotes the survival of our existing brain cells. It promotes the growth of new, healthy new brain cells. Um, so, so it makes new brain cells, and it increases the connections between your brain cells, so your yeah. brain works better. Yeah, you can actually, um, there, I believe there's a YouTube video where they where, uh, BDNF is sprinkled on dendrites, which causes them to sprout. Those are like, like parts of your nerve cells. Yeah. It's like the physical correlates of memories actually. And so that it's spr- like a chia pet and we can, <laughs> we can cause this upregulation of BDNF in our brains by exercising. And I think for a long time, the, the emphasis was on aerobic exercise and aerobic exercise is great. We know that aerobic exercise can cause growth of the memory center of the brain, the hippocampus, which yeah. is vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease and aging. But we now know thanks to new research that whatever the exercise modality is that you enjoy doing, even resistance training can boost BDNF. So just being more active. That's great. So you talk about this thing in the book, uh, which is like a marathon in 10 minutes. Yeah. How do I do that? <laughs> yeah. How do you basically get the benefits of running a marathon in just 10 minutes? It's high intensity interval training. So along with resistance training, I think HIT training, H-I-I-T, crucially important. Um, Which is basically exercising as hard as you can until you're about to throw up and then stopping. Is that it? Pretty much. But doing it, but here's the but here's like the good part. You only have to do it for a few seconds, like 10 to 20 to 30 seconds. Pushing yourself to your max effort and then recuperating and then doing it again. And so what the study found is that when you take subjects and you have them do this hit routine, about a two minute warm up, and then four or five cycles of all out either cycling or swinging around the big heavy battle ropes, which is something that I enjoy doing or doing sprints up a hill, that people are able to achieve the same boost to their cardiorespiratory fitness as people who are doing like 30 to 45 minutes yeah. on of a steady state it's cardio really on a true. treadmill. It's really shy. There's some great studies that I reviewed about this where if you do high intensity interval training, you you literally can exercise like a fraction of the time and get far more benefit than if you ran an hour a day. You burn nine times percent more fat and you actually increase your metabolism. And what's incredible about it is not it's not just the calories you burn when you're exercise. Because you're you're gonna burn more calories if you're running for an hour than if you're doing high intensity interval training. But it speeds up your metabolism so that when you're sitting down or you're on your computer, or you're watching TV, or you're sleeping, you're burning more calories. So, and and people who are fidgeters also tend to burn more calories too. Yeah, people who overeat tend to fidget more. Yeah, And fidgeting is a great way to burn calories actually. Fidgeting falls under the category of non-exercise physical activity that I talk about in the book. That can It's called NEAT, non-exercise. Neat. Yeah, how <laughs> neat is NEAT? You could burn anywhere between 300 and 1,000 calories every day just yeah. with fidgeting, with chasing your cat around the living room. Yeah, I used to be that guy in medical school who kept knocking the kid in the seat in front of him. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't probably, very popular, but I was always fidgeting. He, he probably loved you. <laughs> um, but yeah, going back, going back to high-intensity interval training, what's amazing about it is it kind of does to your cells what calorie restriction does. And calorie restriction, we know, is one of the few ways of uh, extending lifespan in smaller organisms, right? Hmm. High intensity interval training, the way that it works is it creates a momentary energy crisis for your cells where your cells basically say to one another, we've got to keep up or we're going to die. And what they do to keep up is they create healthy new mitochondria. Yeah. 
they uh, there's a process called mitophagy. It's sort mm-hmm. of like aut- autophagy, where old, worn out um, mito- mitochondria that have become dysfunctional basically get gobbled up. Yeah. And this is one of the, I mean, mitochondria that don't function well is at the root of aging, at the root of neurodegenerative conditions. So by doing high intensity interval training, we basically get to, it's like the fountain of youth for, yeah. our, for our cells and our mitochondria. Well, a few of these things you've talked about are, you know, um, very interesting and they, they have to do with ways in which the body gets stressed that activates a healing response, right? Whether it's it's the uh, exercise intensity, whether it's the cold therapy, uh, these have powerful effects like that. It's called hormesis, which is a medical term for it. And it's actually such a good thing to push yourself a little bit because it actually activates all these healing and repair mechanisms. The time-restricted eating, the when to eat, the cryotherapy, the, the exercise intensity, those are all so very scientifically validated mechanisms for activating these healing systems in our body. And they're not that hard, right? Yeah, they're not that hard. Roll around and naked in the snow. Roll around naked in the snow. <laughs> Run as fast as you can until you're throwing up for 10 minutes or <laughs> a few seconds. Yeah. <laughs> and make sure you don't eat before bed. And It's right? so cool. It's so cool. Right. And one of the coolest things about it that I talk about in The Genius Life is this spillover effect that happens. And I don't, I haven't seen this talked about in any other book. So I think this is kind of a, a novel idea that I, one of the novel uh, ideas that I advanced in the, in the genius life, it's that this notion of cross adaptation. So by rolling around in the snow or by sitting in a sauna or by exercising vigorously, these are physical stressors, that hormetic stress that's so good for us, right? Yeah. We know that when we r- r- lie, that we, when we take cold showers, we acclimate. When we go to the gym, you know, and we we get in better shape, we become more capable of doing more exercise. But here's where the here's where cross adaptation is amazing. It can actually make us more resilient in other areas of our life. So by getting more resilient by by acclimating and getting more resilient in the gym and taking these cold showers and sitting in a sauna, you actually can become more uh, psychologically resilient. There's this spillover effect. It's called cross adaptation, whereby wow. you actually can adapt psychologically by imposing a stress on your body physically. All right. So you, you've got this incredible book, The Genius Life. The, the, it's a great book. I, I really recommend it. It's, uh, it's really a tremendous, uh, a tremendous contribution to understanding about how to actually fix our brains and fix our health. Uh, but you make it really simple for people. Uh, you have this 21 day plan for genius living to help reset our brain and our body to its factory settings, which is sounds so good. <laughs> uh, and, and it's like when your computer gets completely screwed up and you have to just turn the thing off and reboot it. Right. Mm. And how does it help fight fatigue, anxiety, depression? How does it optimize your brain health and how does it help you live longer and healthier? So tell us what this 21 day plan is all about. Yeah, it basically puts all the pieces of the puzzle together. I know that, you know, the information that you've gleaned here can sound overwhelming, but uh, I think knowledge is power. And so long as you act on that knowledge, that's really where you're going to see the most bang for your buck. So the book is really all about the simple things that you can do every day that are going to add up cumulatively to big health wins, and you're going to feel them immediately. So whether it's, you know, that small steps for big wins, small steps for big wins, that could have been the subtitle of the book. (laughs) Um, you're you're a pro at this, uh, but yeah, it's so it's it's taking all of those all of those different topics, which I'll admit, you know, circadian biology, nature, can the, each of these topics can can be its own book. But what I've tried to do is I've tried to deliver the most relevant and actionable research in a way that's easy to understand, easy to apply, achievable, um, so that people can can really start to feel better today. And so what I do is I go through. Uh, a four-week program where week one is really getting your um, your stress levels down, boosting your resilience to stress, which we talked about. This is a big topic. Mm. Um, and also going through your kitchen and, and your medicine cabinets and kind of s- questioning a little bit some of the industrial chemicals to which we're routinely exposed, compounds that might be serving as endocrine disruptors. Um, and yeah, right. You got to get rid of all the, the toxins in your home, the things you wash your hair with and put on your skin and your cleaning supplies and the ingredients in your food and yeah, all that, right? Yeah, just sort of cutting down, just to make your body, before we start you know, with any dietary changes, um, it's really about making you the most resilient that you can be. I mean, for example, sleep. Making sure, if, if you are trying to radically change your diet and you're underslept, I mean, you're not gonna be met with success because no. sleep is like, 
I, I use this metaphor from Game of Thrones. I'm a big Game of Thrones nerd. And uh, in Game of Thrones, it's, an, you know, at this point, the show's water under the bridge, so I don't feel like I'm spoiling anything. But you've got to kill the Night King before all the zombie White Walkers uh, fall. By killing the Night King, that's what gets all, this, all the zombies basically defeated. And so by optimizing your sleep, that's the equivalent of killing the Night King. Yeah. All, your other, all the other problems are going to become much easier to so tend to. True. Once you once you improve your sleep, which is which is crucial, sleep is mm-hmm. sacred. It's, med, it's it's another form of medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's all week one, and then week two and three, we go into some dietary modifications. Really, my goal with the dietary recommendations that I make in this book is really in part to heal people's relationship with food, which I think has become so fractured today. Yeah, that relationship that people have with food. You know, there's like the macro wars. Is, you know, is car- carbs, fat. I don't know what to eat. I make it really simple for people. I say that the best thing that you can do is to avoid ultra processed foods. Yes. And we talked about this too. So much. Yeah. yeah on, on when you were on my show, yep. um, which is amazing. I think that if you, if you do nothing else, cutting down on the, on the consumption of ultra processed foods. It's true. I sort of joking that, you know, I, I, I uh, coined this term pegan. It was kind of a joke, a paleo vegan. And my latest book, Food Fix, was number one in paleo and number one in vegan <laughs> on Amazon. I'm like, okay, that's it. And I think, you know, they have way more in common with each other than they do with our traditional American diet. They both believe in whole foods and lots of plants and, you know, just good ingredients uh, and not eating crap. Uh, compared to the traditional American diet or sad diet, the standard American diet, yeah. it's they're, they're more alike than they are compared to that ultra processed diet. So I think that's such an important strategy well said i mean just like ultra processed foods i mean one of the things i feel like few people realize that the the mere processing of food can make a food inherently more fattening if you were to take whole nuts and you 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 know you chew nuts almonds macadamias whatever Mm. a significant portion of the calories that you're consuming you actually end up pooping out whereas if you were to just process lightly those nuts in a, in a grinder and, and turn nuts into nut butter, like almond butter, mm. you're absorbing 100% of those calories. Mm. And so this is, this is true of ultra processed foods that... So make your own nut butter in your mouth, is that the idea? Make your own nut butter in your mouth. <laughs> and I like, I like nut butter too, so not to demonize nut butter or any food really, but, um, but ultra processed foods are extremely calorie dense. Mm-hmm. You're absorbing 100% of the calories. They're not satiating. Um, and so there's that. And then I also make the recommendation to... Uh, focus on protein, really, to bring protein back to the table. I think that's mm. something that the the fitness community has embraced for years. But I think most people are kind of confused about the role that protein plays in health. That's like a whole podcast in and of I know. itself. We got to come back to talk we'll about. We'll come protein back. Yes, so much controversy. Plant protein, animal protein. Should we eat less meat? Should we eat no meat? Should we focus on only plant proteins? Um, I've written a lot about this, and I think protein quality matters. I think the utilization of the proteins are different if it's plant or animal protein. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of plant proteins that are great, but you know you have to eat a lot to get the equivalent of what you get. You know, you eat three cups of beans, and good luck if you can eat them to be equivalent to the amount of protein that you'd get in a six ounce piece of fish or chicken. Yeah, I'm eating three cups of beans. I'm going to have to work from home that day. <laughs> Exactly. Well, Max, you are a genius, and I I love what you do. I love the, the intelligence you bring to the work you do. I think uh, those of you who aren't acquainted with Max, you better get acquainted. His new book, The Genius Life: Heal Your Mind, Strengthen Your Body, and Become Extraordinary, which sounds like a great aspiration. I'm on that track. Uh, is out. Uh, you can get it on Amazon anywhere you get your books. Go to geniuslifebook.com. To learn more about the book and Max's work, and uh, and you will not be disappointed because he's the real deal. And uh, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast and to learn from you. I've learned so many interesting things today that I actually didn't know, <laughs> so it was really good for me. And I hope you all learned something. And if you love this podcast, please share it with your friends and family on social media. Leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Share it with your friends and family, as I said, and um, subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And we'll see you next week on the Doctor's Pharmacy.